morning, everybody. So nice to see all these smiling faces here today. Welcome. Let's start with a word of prayer today. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house again today. Thank you for all these people here in the households and families that they represent. Father, we just thank you again, and we just ask, Lord, that our hearts and our minds and our ears are open. We ask you, Father, that you just be with Adam as he delivers your word. And we just thank you and praise your precious and holy name for this church and for our church family. And we just pray, Father, a blessing over every service that's being held in your name all over the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Let's stand and sing today, shall we? Gather at the river, page 265 in your blue hymnal. this morning. Our tithes and offering box remains in the foyer. We hope you'll take advantage of that. Sunday school is directly after church today. We do hope you'll join us with that. Choir practice Tuesday night at 6 p.m. We hope you will come out for that and participate. So wonderful to have our choir again. Thank you, Norman. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any announcements today? Yeah, I wish you a happy birthday. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. This day, 54 years ago, my lovely mother Nancy. 
<laughs> gave birth to this. I'm sure she didn't know what she was in for, but she did. And thank God for it. I have been blessed with them. You had to. Yes, absolutely. Look at you, she had a beautiful smile. <laughs> well, thank you, though. All right. If we don't have any other announcements, anybody have any praise and prayer requests? We got several listed in our bulletin. Oh. I'm sorry, who? Lee Perkins? Rosa Lee Perkins. Please remember her. Uh, Kathy Meadows. Yeah. She's got blood clots. Kathy Meadows and Shirley Franklin. She fell in front of Shirley. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Gloria had a pacemaker put in. That's why they're not there or here today. Any other prayer requests or praises? All right. I'm sorry, who? Oh, great. Betty Taylor is home with Home Health. Hope she's doing well. If we have no more, then we will do our choir special now. Southern seminaries, a young man was studying the Word of God and was asked to define the word grace. Now this young man had been saved by God's grace, but in his heart he felt he just didn't have the words to explain what it meant, so he went to his father. He said, Father, tomorrow I must answer the question, just what is the meaning of the word grace? This father looked at his son a long time and said, Son, a long time ago, down on my knees, God saved me by his grace. But truly, I know only one answer I can give, and this is what he said. This young man wasn't quite satisfied with this answer, so naturally he turned to his mother. He said, Mother, tomorrow I must answer this question, and I know you can help me. Just what is the meaning of the word grace? This mother looked at her son through tear-dimmed eyes. She said, Son, it's been many years since God saved me by His grace, and Son, it's by His grace that I taught you to be the man you are today. But truly, I know only one answer, and this is what she said. This young man pondered these things in his heart. On the next day, he returned to class, and the professor said, Now, son, we'd like for you to stand and tell this class just what you think the meaning of the word grace is. He arose to his feet with the Spirit of God in his heart and tears in his eyes. He said, Yes, sir, today I know the meaning of the word grace. And this is what he said.
Good morning, everybody. Certainly it's good to see you here this morning. Always a joy to be back here with you again for Frosty and me. Looks like the weather is trying to figure out what he wants to do today. But rain or shine, whatever the weather, it's a blessing. And it's an extra blessing that we are able to gather here together in the Lord's house this morning to worship him. And I'm so glad to see you all sitting out there today. I hope you had a great week and I hope we're going to have a great service this morning. Already off to a good start. Early this week, I found myself thinking about what it means to lead and live a Christian life. As Christians, we believe in God and we believe he sent his son, Jesus, to live on earth as a man and suffer and die on the cross in payments for our sins. We go to church. We come forward and profess our faith in Jesus and we get baptized. And certainly all those things are very important elements and attributes of Christian life. But I began to ponder what it means to actually live your life, your entire life, every element of your life with your faith at the forefront of your time here on earth. For so many, we go to church on Sunday and we pray from time to time. And if you ask us, we say, yeah, I believe. I'm a Christian. Of course I believe. But you might be thinking, I wish you wouldn't bother me right now. I got other things on my mind or my favorite show is on, or I'm trying to watch this ball game, or I got to do this thing for my boss. Things that the world compels us, for good reasons and bad, to focus on, but they leave God and Jesus all too often as secondary considerations. At best, secondary considerations. Sometimes we think about when we go to church once a week, we think about Jesus when we go to church once a week, for an hour or so. But it takes more than that to live as a Christian, to live your life as a Christian, doesn't it? It means to actually center your life around your faith and live day to day, hour to hour as a Christian. So I started thinking about it during the day while I was doing things that didn't require a lot of concentration like mowing the yard and walking the dog or driving up and down Route 11 a few times as I had to do last week. I began to list and then to examine what I thought were the elements of a Christian life. To be more than a Sunday morning Christian, but have your faith as the very center of your daily life. The first thing I concluded is that's much more easy to say, much easier to say than it is to do. The world has gotten so very complicated and it moves so fast. So many harmful distractions are too easily accessible now. They're more than just acceptable, accessible. They're practically shoved in your face every minute, every waking minute of every day. They're practically shoved in your face. They're flashy. They look fun and exciting. And they demand attention. Society is conditioned to pursue instant, easy, effortless gratification and all that brings a hollow temporary happiness at best. A walk with God on the other hand is a lifelong walk. The road will have steep climbs out of deep valleys and it will take us to high peaks only to plummet down again on the other side of that peak. We don't always get what we want or even what we think we need. We're so conditioned to go after the flashy, popular goal that then when God wants us to actually pursue. Sometimes when we get what God actually knows we need, we find it boring compared to all the distractions in, in common life. Being a faithful Christian is not likely to make you more popular and you probably won't be the envy of all your friends and co-workers. It's not easy. And the biggest payoff comes years down the road. But hard as it is to lead a Christian life, we will be happier and more content in the long run. And our reward will be eternal life in the place Jesus prepared for us in his Father's house. 
So I continued thinking about what it takes to live a true Christian life, and I had to, had to truly think about it because it's something I have yet to perfect in my life. I'm not even close. And as strong as my Christian upbringing and personal belief are, I've only recently, and I mean very recently, began to even consider what I need to do to actually live a Christian life. I've always been intensely focused on my responsibilities at work and at home more than anything. So I had to think about it. In doing so, I came up with four broad elements. There are certainly more than four, but broadly speaking, I came up with four and I also want you to keep in mind that I am far from the smartest person in any room I'm standing in. And any well-trained theologian with far more education on the subject than I possess could certainly do a better job than I. But the feeling that I should speak about this this morning would not go away, although I wish I was better equipped to do it justice. The first element of a Christian life, as I concluded, is to have an active, personal relationship with God. This is more than just simply going to church, more than believing there is a God, that he sent his son Jesus, and the Bible is true. I mean, after all, I believe George Washington was the first president of the United States, that he held the colonies together during the Revolutionary War, and that he led us in the early days of our nation. But simply believing that does nothing for me. Just as simply believing that God exists does, uh, does very little for me. After all, Satan himself believes in God. We should build a personal relationship with our Heavenly Father and have Him in all aspects of our life. Prayer, constant, sincere prayer is the key to that relationship. We all pray at times. Maybe you say a blessing before a meal. Maybe you pray when you go to bed at night. And if you do that much, you're probably doing more than most people who call themselves Christians. Most of us say a prayer when we're stressed. We say, Lord, please help me pass this test. Or God, please help our kids to get home safely. But I wonder how many people pray just to talk to God. To tell him what's on your mind. What you're worried about. To say you miss someone you lost or to express what you're sorry for. To ask him for wisdom, for strength, and forgiveness. To seek his will and his guidance. To turn your problems over to him and to say thank you for your life and all the wonderful people in it. In Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18, the Apostle Paul tells the people in the church at Thessalonica, Rejoice always. Pray continuously. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In hard times, pray for strength. In good times, say a prayer of thanks and rejoice. When you're scared, pray for courage. If you or a loved one are sick, pray for healing. When you face a tough decision, pray for guidance. Pray for your family and friends. Pray for our leaders. Pray for the church. When you have no one to talk to, talk to God. And then, be quiet and listen and wait on the Lord. The second Christian life element is to practice being holy. Work to be godly in your daily life. Spend more time studying God's Word than you do on social media or watching television. I discovered this... Um, Christian columnist recently named Dr. Josh Daffern. Um, and I recently discovered uh, an article that he wrote, which in that article he said, when God begins to transform us, he starts with our minds. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's from Romans 12, verse 2. If you can change the way you think, Dr. Daffern says, you can change the way you live. But to change the way you think, you've got to put something in it better than social media, talk radio, hours of television, whatever. Read your Bible. Listen to it on the way to work. Join a Bible study. Watch pastors you enjoy online. Spend more time in the Bible than anything else. Make it the dominant influencer of your mind and you will be transformed. 
So read the Bible to learn the character of God and his expectations for us, and then make a concerted effort to model yourself after the example Jesus set for us and live according to his expectations as laid out in his word. Turn away from any simple habits you have. And I tell you from personal experience, when God starts the transformation Dr. Daffron mentioned in that quote I just read, you will actually want to turn away from that sin, the thing that you always thought you were enjoying, that made you happy, that kept you satisfied, that gave you a little thrill, a little jazz in your life. You will actually want to turn away from that and leave it behind. I've been reflecting on that newfound desire I had to turn away from sin when I saw a video excerpt from a Billy Graham sermon. What a wonderful man and incredible preacher Billy Graham was. I miss him greatly. In this sermon he said, the closer you get to Christ, the more sinful you're going to feel. Everyone who has ever seen a true reflection of God is deeply convicted of his own sin. The fact that you are aware of your sin and feeling guilty about it is a sign of spiritual life. And what a powerful sign of growth it is that you are aware of your sin and want to leave it behind. Timothy 4.8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The first two things, having a personal relationship with God and practicing godliness, are tough to do. And the times I came closest to succeeding at it were the times I was surrounded by a strong, devoted brotherhood and sisterhood of fellow Christians. And the third element of a Christian life, as I see it now, is active fellowship with other believers. Surrounding yourself with strong Christians who have confidence in their faith and holding them as your mentors will help you grow and strengthen your own faith. And you know what? So does being a mentor yourself to others who are less far along on their road to a strong relationship with God. The very act of wanting to be a good example for them will help you be a better Christian. In Romans chapter 1 verses 11 and 12, Paul told the members of the church in Rome, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. A big part of living a Christian life, and a fourth element I thought of, is to witness to others. And a lot of people have the idea that being a Christian witness means knocking on people's doors and asking them, may I come in and tell you about Jesus? Or interjecting yourself into a conversation and saying things like, I'd like to give you all my testimony. And there's certainly a place for that. But I think it's far more effective to just be an example in the way you live your life. Don't be heard gossiping and do not judge. Don't speak harshly. Be humble. Practice charity. Pay attention to other people and lift them up when they're down. Be the example. I read something a few days ago that I could not find when I tried to go back and read it again so I could use it here, but it said something to the effect of, don't just tell people about the gospel, be the gospel. Be the gospel they need. Do your best to ensure people look at you and think, what a good person he is. I always feel better when I'm around her. During that time I told you about when I was surrounded by a strong circle of fellow Christians, I put the fish emblem on the tailgate of my truck. The one a lot of people call the Jesus fish. We talked about that a little bit last week. Not because I wanted to say, hey, look at me. I'm a Christian. I did it because it helped me to be a better example. Because I could not bear the idea of anyone seeing me lash out in a fit of road rage or being judgmental or being hateful and have people see me and see that fish on my truck and think, that guy's a Christian. That's not what I want to be. I don't want any part of that. I needed that kind of aid in my life at that point to motivate me 
to be a better Christian and be a better example. I worked hard to keep a smile on my face, to display grace when I was frustrated, to be humble, to ask for forgiveness and to give it, and to simply love my fellow man. In short, I tried for a, lot, a while to live my life so that my faith in God was obvious and people felt they wanted to have that kind of faith themselves. Unfortunately, the stresses of life caused a significant backsliding when I left that community, but I felt the effectiveness of it in wanting to be the gospel for others in my life during those years. In another quote, Dr. Jo Josh Daffron said, we are created, created to live in community. You need your church. Your church needs you. You need other believers. When church becomes optional, everyone suffers. So don't isolate yourself. Join a Bible study group. Have people over to your house for dinner. Do life with other believers. It's the only way you will truly grow. For him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And that's from Ephesians 4.16. Like any good father feels about his children, God wants us to have a relationship with him. If you are raising or have raised children, you no doubt had to discipline them at one time or another. If you're like me, you sometimes felt guilty about having to discipline your own sweet child. But we know that's the right thing to do and the Lord will find ways to discipline us. Frosina's younger daughter is about an 11 hour drive from home. Her big sister, our older daughter, is another 11 or more hours beyond that. We don't get to see them very often. They don't make their home, way home very often. Frosty and I miss them badly. But the Bible reveals our Heavenly Father has the same feelings about His children and wishes that we would make our way home to Him more often than we do. In Revelations 3, verses 19 and 20, Jesus told John the Revelator, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. That scene is depicted on that stained glass window right there, in fact. Christ standing at the door and knocking, hoping that we'll hear and let him in. This is a standing invitation from God to open that door and let him into our lives. The trouble is, the distractions of the world are so loud and so difficult to ignore. They demand our attention and make it nearly impossible to hear that invitation, much less focus enough to accept, enjoy, and in reap the benefits of a personal relationship with the living God. I used to tell my troops, if this job was easy, anyone could do it. You're here because you've been trained and selected to do something important. We're counting on you to have the drive and discipline to get it done right. A Christian who has spent his lifetime in church, who has gone to Sunday school, been part of Bible studies, and read the Bible on their own, has the training to do that very important job. We're counting on you and on all of us together to do that job right. Just doing all the things I just mentioned, going to Sunday school, going to church, reading the Bible, doesn't mean that uh, we've paid attention enough to imply it, but at least we have that training and we con should continue to pursue it. Another very common expression for people in uniform, in the military and the fire service where I spend a lot of time now, uh, the expression is, the most important duty of a leader is to train the next generation of leaders. That's the same for Christians. We should always be working to help new Christians grow in their faith and their relationship with God. For both groups, the long-time Christians and those who have just started to come to the Lord, the biggest challenge is to overcome the distraction of worldly things that requires us to have the drive, discipline, and focus to go along with all of our biblical training. At times in my life, in, a, in an off-and-on kind of way, 
I had the habit of reading a chapter of the Old Testament every day, then a chapter of the New Testament, a chapter of Psalms, which covers man's relationship to God, and a chapter of Proverbs, which covers man's relationship with his fellow man. One chapter of the Old Testament, one chapter of the New Testament, one chapter of Psalms, and one of Proverbs every day. That was a very ben beneficial habit in terms of my focus as a Christian. Maybe you'd like to give it a try and see if it's helpful to you. As a side note on all that, the first apartment I lived in in Jerusalem during my year there, for about the first five months that I was there, I had a giant balcony off the, bed, or the living room of that apartment, and then I had a smaller balcony off my bedroom. And if you stood in the right place on the big balcony, you could look down, because the apartment building set up on a ridge overlooking the old city of Jerusalem. You could look down and see into it. And if you stood anywhere on the balcony off my bedroom, you had an even better view into the old city. And I would stand there on that bedroom balcony early in the morning, especially at sunrise, uh, I don't know, just sets the mood a little better for me. It makes such a beautiful uh, sunrise over there. Um, and I would look down, I'd read a verse, and I would look up, and I would see the Mount of Olives over there. And the Garden of Gethsemane sets at the foot of the Mount of Olives, and you could see the tops of the trees. Or I could look over and pick out certain points in the old city of Jerusalem and look down at the verse that I just read and went, wow, that happened right over there. That thing I've been reading about in the Bible all my life, and I learned uh, in Sunday school, I heard the stories. I'm just a, a hillbilly redneck boy from Vinton, Virginia, and here I am doing something I never thought I would do, seeing all these places and these things, and it was especially moving, but I'm digressing. That was just a very um, inspirational thing for me to be there uh, so near to the sites of uh, that were covered in the verses that I was reading at the time. You just can't imagine the sense of awe I felt any time I read a passage of the Bible and looked up and said, hey, that happened right over there. But even with all that incredible motivation, the habit fell by the wayside because of the very demanding aspect of my job there and all the aspects, uh, it, uh, all the stress that it involved. <clears throat> It's not easy setting aside time for the elements of your Christian life. God isn't right there in our faces demanding our attention. Instead, he is polite, politely waiting for us to open the door for him and likely hoping we will have the sense to realize that opening the door is a more important task than all the other things competing for our attention. If you look at the life of David, he had a deep personal relationship with God. But even this anointed king, this founder of the city of Jerusalem, found it easier to walk with the Lord when he was just a simple shepherd boy than he did when he became this mighty king. The demands and stresses of the battles he fought and the responsibilities that came with his crown distracted him from his relationship with the Lord and left him open to temptations. In Psalms 46, David wrote, God is our refuge and strength, our ever-present hope in trouble. Therefore we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river which streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at day break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease at the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says... Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The simplest definition of the noun Christian is a person who believes in Jesus Christ or practices Christianity. 
Being a Christian and living a Christian life are not necessarily the same things. Believing in Jesus, admiring his teachings, and going to church may fit the dictionary's definition of Christianity. But if we walk out the church door at the end of Sunday service and barely think about Christ until the next Sunday, we aren't making an effort to lead a Christian life. Brothers and sisters, maybe every one of you is already faithfully, faithfully doing the things, and I'm the only one here who finds it difficult. But my sense is we all struggle with walking the Christian walk. Perhaps my analysis of what it takes to lead a Christian life is far too simplistic. But I felt compelled to urge you to develop that close personal relationship with the Lord. Hear Him knocking and let Him in. Pray without ceasing. Strive to practice godliness in your daily lives. Put forth the effort to leave worldly sinful activities behind and take a more spiritual path. Surround yourself with Christians of strong faith who are also seeking to live a Christian life. Learn from the ones who are further along in their relationship with God and mentor the ones coming along behind you on the path to life with the Lord. Lean on each other. Support each other. Grow together. Finally, be a witness and an embodiment of the gospel. Be the strong, disciplined, calm, peaceful example of Christian love who those seeking something more fulfilling than the loud, blindingly bright trappings of modern life can follow. The rewards of Christian life won't be financial. It won't prevent the trials and hardships that come in our lives on earth, but it will make them easier to handle. Having a solid foundation in Christ helps us stand up to tough times. I've been watching this guy named Sean Ryan for a little while, and this is pretty much a postscript to the sermon that I've pretty much already finished composing when I saw something that uh, Mr. Ryan uh, put online. He interviews people from various walks of life, but almost all of them are ex-military. Uh, most of them are men, a few women. And occasionally he will interview someone with no military background at all, but all of them are carrying the burden of some sort of trauma in their lives. PTSD, things like that. And that's what drew me in, personally, to get me uh, regularly watching his show. And that's just some background on the nature of his show. I'm telling you a story because two days ago, I was absolutely stunned to see him post this. And I should tell you that never in anything I've seen him say in his shows did he indicate that he had any Christian faith at all or any other kind of faith at all. In fact, you would, hearing his language and whatnot, you would come to think that maybe he wasn't a believer. And actually, he probably wasn't because he posted something just uh, a few days ago that I read and it really hit me hard. He said, today I began reading the Bible, something I've never done. I believe this is the only truth left here in earth. Maybe the only truth there ever was. Everything else has turned to nothing but deception and lies. All of it. That moved me so much, reading this Statement, simple few words, few sentences from a former Navy SEAL, a guy who was a contractor for the CIA uh, after he got out of the Navy. It was very moving. And then yesterday morning, I saw another post from him. He said, I have been trying to make sense of all that is happening in my country and in the world, only to conclude that there is no sense to be made. The absurdness has led me to find Christ. Here I am. I honestly sobbed when I read that. Here's this guy, like I said, a former Navy SEAL and, and a CIA contractor, a man who has been through so much, seen so many terrible things, has to carry such a heavy burden on his heart, and been around people in even worse shape than him. A guy who knows things that most of us don't know things I probably don't even know with my background and still he has concluded the things of this earthly world are all lies and the Word of God is the only truth there ever was. 
I had most of this sermon already composed, like I said, when I read that. I can't think of a more powerful example of how much we need Christ in our lives. Beyond sitting here on Sunday morning, beyond having a Bible by your bed that you never open, I'm talking about, I'm preaching about a deep, abiding relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if there's anything I can do to help you get there, I'm so very willing, and I will be looking to all of you to help move me down that road as well. Would you bow your heads and pray with me now, brothers and sisters? Almighty and all-merciful God, creator of the world, ruler, bringer of mercy and healing and peace, Lord, we realize that we so badly need you in our lives. Beyond that, we need to live a life in you. Help us in that walk. Help us strengthen our faith. Help us apply the teachings of your son Jesus in our daily lives. Grow us into examples that will bring others to you. We realize that the truth of your word is the only truth that matters in this world, Lord. And we ask that you give us the strength and the focus to get deeper into your word and learn more of all the many things that it has to offer. Father, there have been those who are lifted to you in prayer because they are sick, because they are hurt, because they've fallen on hard times. Lord, if it's your will, we ask that you heal them and that you restore their prosperity. Father, we ask so humbly that you keep us safe, that you deliver us from temptation, and that you allow us to be back here in your house to worship and praise you again next Sunday. All these things we ask in the holy name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen.